thank you. Mm -hmm. I love it. I want to welcome you to Ambrose University this evening. I am very glad that you've come. And, uh, but I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging that Ambrose University is situated on the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7 in southern Alberta. And the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. My name is Joanne Badley, and I'm Dean of Theology here at Ambrose. Every year, the Faculty of Theology hosts the Downey Lectures, a, seri a lecture series endowed by the family and friends of a longtime teacher at Canadian Bible College, which was a predecessor institution of this school. The Downey is an opportunity to bring world-shaping theologians to Calgary. And I am sure you will agree that this year we have certainly accomplished that. Next year, around this time in October, we will have Dr. Nije Gupta, a New Testament scholar who is passionate about academic work that also serves pastors and the church. But this evening, I am very happy to welcome again Dr. Elaine Storkey, for a second lecture on the topic of one of her recent books, Scars Across Humanity, Understanding and Overcoming Violence Against Women. Earlier this evening, she introduced herself as a public Christian. And her record of accomplishments certainly bears this out. Dr. Storkey is a philosopher, a sociologist, and a theologian who has taught at a number of universities in Great Britain and the United States. She is a fellow of the University of Wales, a former director of the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, and a member of Newnham College, Cambridge. She's also lectured in Africa, Asia, and Haiti. Her presidency of Tear Fund, the aid and development <laughs> agency, spanned 17 years. A broadcaster and an author, she's been a passionate advocate for justice and gender issues for 30 years, implementing many changes for women through 28 years on the General Synod of the Church of England. And so please join me now in warmly welcoming 
Dr. Storkley, Storkey for her second lecture in these Downey Lectures. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I kept you for a long time last night, so it's very good of you to come back. Um, I hope this session will be slightly shorter so that we will have time for questions at the end. But I want to do at uh, the beginning is to clarify what we're not going to do this evening. We are looking at wrestling with domestic violence in our context, but we're not looking at all of the kind of problems that couples have in their relationships. We're not looking at the run of the mill <coughs> issues that bug families and all the rest of it. We leave those kinds of things to the cartoonists. <coughs> Advice given to son from father. Well, son, men need women because there are just some things you can't blame on the government. All the kind of stereotypes that we often have of men and women. <coughs> um, and I like honesty in a relationship. I'm not into playing games, says the woman. <coughs> Whereas the guy clearly isn't into honesty. He's hiding behind a clown mask. Or, this uh, one is a fairly typical one, a woman with men, uh, her husband's feet, and the caption is, Pastor, I'd like you to meet my husband, Cal, who's decided to come to church this Sunday. <laughs> there are lots and lots of stereotypes of dysfunctional couples or families that the um, cartoonists have a wonderful time with, and we can celebrate those. The reason that they're funny is because these relationships are very important ones. And of course, there's the whole issue of gender differences, the way in which women are so skilled at multitasking and the men can only concentrate on one thing at once. Excuse me, Harold, why should I go and slip into something more comfortable? <clears throat> Says she, wearing a chainsaw and various gardening implements. He, meanwhile, is sitting down waiting for a quiet evening of intimacy. <coughs> the one I like most of all is this one. Oh no, two more. Um, <clears throat> well, the caption says, you can just rebuild the fort later, Harold. Phyllis and Shirley are coming over and I need the cushions. What's happening there is that the man is bidding for space, for autonomy, for silence. He doesn't want a bunch of clucking women around him. And uh, again, that's a part of a stereotype that we often have of people in relationships. But this one is a relationship that's gone a little bit sour. It's been going on for a very, very long time. And uh, she's actually sick and tired and fed up, and she's venting her irritation um, with her husband because she now feels that she's part of the wallpaper. Nobody's taking any notice. Uh, he's not even communicating. Honestly, I could be sitting here, she says in her naggy voice, start naked for all you care, and you wouldn't take a blind bit of notice. The problem with, with the, the issue there is that she doesn't see the full picture. And the full picture is... He's sitting there stark naked, and she's not taking a blind bit of notice. Some marriages just need to be woken up, um, where partners really do need to communicate. And there's the issue of, well, what happens when a man really tries to be lovey-dovey and touchy-feely and empathetic and all the things a woman really wants? Well, even that can go wrong. <laughs> so the, what we're not looking at, then, are those kinds of issues. We're not trying to tease out and sort out all the problems that men and women have in their relationships today. I'll find the proper one I'm going to give you tonight <coughs> in a second. <coughs> what we're really looking at then is uh, seriously dysfunctional relationships which feature on violence. This is a quote from the United Nations General Secretary when he was it, General Ban Ki-moon, who was an enormous friend of women and a very great advocate for sorting out violent relationships. And this is what he said, there's one universal truth applicable to all countries, cultures, and communities. Violence against women is never acceptable, never excusable, never tolerable. And probably he did more than any other general secretary to put those feelings and those issues into practice. And so what we're looking at now is intimate partner violence at home. Crucial areas of um, issues that with, within couples and within coupledom that we really need to look at very seriously. First of all, of course, we've got to decide and try to define um, 
where intimate partner violence comes in the whole spectrum of what's happening in our culture today with regard to sexualization and regard to human relationships. And I don't know whether you recognize this quote in Canada, but it's certainly one that we recognize in Europe. The research from a very wide range of resources suggests that for the last few years, our societal view of women has actually got worse. Whether it's from violent pornography, violent computer games, street harassment, or even everyday sexism, it's actually creating a view of women which nurtures or normalizes women's violation. And this goes along concurrently with the emancipation of women, if you like, with the increased number of women in the professions, with their advancement in areas of promotion and so on, and with their increased skills. The dark side, the underbelly of that, is all of this. There's still a great deal of rape culture and pornography and so on. And this is a, a YouGov survey in Britain which concluded that girls and young women are growing up today in the UK being exposed to unwanted sexual attention, harassment and assault. And it's almost an, an everyday experience, as came out, of course, in the Me Too Award, Me Too program. So what is domestic violence? What is intimate partner violence? What is domestic abuse? This is our UK government's definition. Any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, threatening behavior, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members, regardless of sex, gender or sexuality. And the next bit is quite important. The abuse can encompass, but is not limited to psychological, physical, sexual, financial, and emotional. The Crown Post and Inclusion Service's Violence Against Women strategy in, introduced um, 10 years ago now, records statistics for domestic violence, forced marriage, honor-based violence, and so on. So you see the list is starting to get bigger already by 2007. All of these other aspects of violence against women are coming into the categories that we're having to um, make statistics for and do research on. When you come to Canada, we have some very interesting definitions of violence too, violence against women, what we mean by domestic violence, put out by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And they specify it very, very carefully. So there are physical threats of violence, um, physical aspects of violence, which can be threats, attacks, made by fists, or made by any object to a woman, on a woman. And they list them, pushing, shoving, slapping, kicking, striking, choking, hitting, beating, and so on. The physical violence is part of domestic violence. But that doesn't include uh, sexual violence. That has to have a category of its own. Any forced sexual activity and other forms of sexual coercion. And these, of course, can take place in a marriage relationship as well as outside a marriage relationship. There is now a marital rape is an offense just as any other offense against the person. But that doesn't include everything. So you have to have an emotional category too. Um, violence against women or sexual abuse can also be words or actions designed to control or frighten an intimate partner destroying their self-esteem, giving them feelings of shame, making them feel like rubbish, undermining them, belittling them, humiliating them, landing them with anxiety or hopelessness so that they actually lose their identity and sense of self. But there's also financial. And many abuse victims have found that they are now controlled or their um, intimate, their partners, uh, sorry, their money or their resources or property has been acquisitioned by their partner and they have lost all access to it. That's a very, very common factor. So it's very difficult for persons to, op to uh, escape from that relationship because they now have, have not got the means to do so financially. And then there's this category that we don't have in the UK, but you have here, and that is a category of neglect. For us, this comes under a different kind of legal protocol. We're a situation where a person has responsibility to provide care or assistance for someone, but actively 
does not do so. That's also uh, under this category from the police here. If you look at the reports that have come out in Canada, they're very, very interesting. Um, looking at the statistics on family violence and on intimate partner violence. 67% of family violence victims are women and girls, which does, of course, leave that 33% are male, usually boys, actually, and sometimes elderly people as well. And the 2017 report showed that you got intimate partner violence representing close to a third of all police-reported violent crime in Canada. And they give you this figure of 96,000 victims in that particular age group. Of course, that's only the tip of the iceberg. That's only the police reported violent crime. And the reality of domestic violence is that the majority of it is not reported. Something between 60 and 90% of domestic violence never gets as far as the police and is not reported. Women were over overrepresented as victims of intimate partner violence. Eight out of every 10, 80% of the victims are actually female. And in fact, that's the most common violence experienced by women. The most common violence is not rape or harassment or being knocked around or anything else. It's actually within intimate partner relationships. You can find all those figures for yourself if you want to do. Then you also did a very interesting study of work violence <coughs> in uh, Canada. <coughs> and this was done a couple of years ago. The Canadian government surveyed federal staff about sexual harassment and violence at work, which is in many senses a carryover from the violence that people undergo at home. And 60% of the female respondents, and it was quite a sizable sample, reported that they had been harassed at work. That is a strikingly high figure when you look at what harassment actually includes. And so a bill, this bill C65, defining harassment, promoting training and complaints procedure has actually gone through your government. Uh, it's passed in, in May last year and now it's become law um, in May this year. And it doesn't offer very much, but it does insist that there must be proper training and proper complaints procedures. So these aspects of work can't just slip through the cracks anymore. They have to be dealt with and they have to be looked at. Um, this is what uh, a number of uh, surveys say. In Canada, some women have fewer economic opportunities, face bigger gender wage gap, at a higher risk of gender-based violence than others. And this is very important. Don't let's stereotype those people. Don't let's put them in a category of, uh, of disadvantaged or ignorant or stupid or uneducated people. It isn't because they're less intelligent. It isn't because they're not trying hard enough. It happens, and this is a key point, because of a greater systemic discrimination in their lives. In other words, they can belong to minority groups. They can belong to indigenous people's groups or they can actually be in situations where the whole uh, weights are loaded against them. Women who experience spousal violence are also more likely to endure extreme forms of assault. So spousal violence, if you actually um, are suffering from uh, sexual or physical violence, it uh, has a tendency to become more violent and more extreme as the relationship continues. What might have started at first with a shove or a push um, eventually becomes some of these things, including choking, beating, being threatened with a knife or gun, and sexual violence. These don't usually start at the beginning of a violent relationship. If you started a relationship this way, it would not continue. Certainly nobody who is uh, wise and uh, in, in charge of their relationship would enter a relationship if this is the way it began. But actually, it's usually when the relationship is underway, doesn't have to have been underway very long, and the person has to be besotted with their partner before they realize things are not as they thought they were. And then, of course, there's dating. Many violent uh, relationships begin in the dating process. And in fact, there was a study done in the United Kingdom, which I wonder if it's mirrored here. I don't know. I've looked for some figures, but I can't find them. A study done on teenage adolescent relationships, which actually broke my heart when I read the study. And I wasn't the only one. 
It's a very careful study done with a lot of pediatricians and sociologists and researchers from different universities and also the NSPCC, the National Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And what they concluded in this very widespread interview research was that intimacy, part of intimacy, uh, was now accepted to be violent. And many people, just many girls in particular, thought the fact that their boyfriend beat them up occasionally or raped them was nothing very strange. This is what they were now led to believe was normal within an intimate relationship. And that shocked the researchers. Sociological researchers are not usually very shocked about things. They just report their findings in a rather bold way. But when you read this report, you read the shock that they found they had when they discovered the level of violence that was happening in adolescent teenage relationships and were being accepted as somehow normal. So all of these things are um, going on in our midst, in our cultures, right under our noses, day after day, and it's a very striking phenomenon. Approximately every six days in Canada, a woman is killed by her intimate partner. Now I think you have a population of something like, what is it, 37 million? Which actually is really quite a high figure for a population of that size. Women are more than four times more likely than men to experience intimate partner homicide. I want to say a little bit more about that in a minute. If you look at UK comparisons, and I want to do that because I know so much more about the UK, most incidents are not reported to the police. And yet, even so, the police are receiving a domestic violence-related call every 30 seconds. Whilst we've been having this conversation here tonight, the police in the UK, even during the night, their telephones will have been ringing constantly with domestic violence calls. They didn't used to take them seriously. They used to just refer to them as little domestics, and now they do because police are very carefully trained to weed out and to understand and to take note of, because if they don't, homicide might well be the result. And over two women are killed by a partner or either current or former partner every single week in the UK. We have a population of 66 million, so in fact the figure is higher for us than it is for you. But just let that soak in. Two at least two every week are killed by their partners. That's a very high homicide rate. Studies over the last decade have also indicated that higher rates of intimate partners and violence occur more amongst indigenous people in Canada. And there's specific groups in the UK too where you will see a higher incident of violence, <clears throat> partly because violence has been uh, brought into those cultures by externally or partly because they are endemic in those cultures for very long historical reasons. <coughs> in fact, if you actually wanted to summarize the crime figure surveys, <coughs> in the UK they would look something like this. <coughs> 1 million, 1.4 million women suffer domestic violence annually. That's, uh, those are figures are taken from women's refuge and women's aid who are dealing with helplines and are dealing at the coalface far more than the police because they're not just police reported figures. One in four women will suffer it in their lifetime. Uh, that's probably a very conservative figure. Other researchers suggest it's higher than that. But this is the very important point, the following one. If you were burgled next week, uh, you would think it extremely unfortunate and highly unlikely if you were burgled again the following week and then the week after that or a month later. You just wouldn't happen. We don't experience crime in a serial kind of way. If somebody kind of um, <clears throat> came and stole your purse or your wallet or did a fraud in your bank, if this were repeated over and over again, you would be extremely alarmed and all the systems will be put in place. But actually, with uh, domestic violence, it occurs all the time. It is the most often repeated crime that exists. It's very unlikely to have an isolated case of domestic violence. It's cumulative, it's continuous, and it's very high. 
I'd looked at a report just before I came away to see if there was anything new coming out of the most recent reports. They come out very regularly now in the UK because we've got the statisticians working hard on this. And literally, just last month, this is what we found. We now have the highest level of domestic uh, violence in our country that's been recorded over the last 18 months. We have actually beat all the records in terms of domestic violence being recorded. And this is in a so-called country, a civilization, where we have, we are told, robust laws that prevent violence against women. I'd like to see where those laws are and how they are indicated. More women are ending up as homicide victims. And in fact, if you just looked at the months between January and when the figures were compiled in August, 100 women had already been killed by their partners or their former partners. Now, there's a huge problem in collecting data on violence against women. And one of the problems of collecting data in the UK, I've looked hard at how you collect it in Canada, and it just seemed to have even more problems than we have. But one of our problems is, in order not to get completely bogged down by the repetitive incidents of violence against women, um, there's a cap on five. So you put down five incidents and those are counted. And of course, that's utterly ridiculous. Uh, as this woman says, when she was asked to um, kind of report on her uh, experience of domestic silent, uh, violence, how can you possibly put on cap on something and say that after five times, it doesn't count? I remember all the incidents. I remember all the things that were done to me. And to say we're only going to count five times makes me feel worthless. It's like, somehow this is your fault. It's like, if it had happened more than five times, then you must have been asking for it. And so even the way we collect statistics is value-loaded. And it's actually a problem for those people who are on the receiving end of this. And we have no idea of the actual level of domestic violence uh, from police and other official statistics. We only have a glimmering because of what we see from women's aid, women's refuge, and from the homicide figures. What actually causes domestic violence um, and partner violence? Well, it can be triggered to related to trigger points, uh, unemployment, financial loss, depression, and so on. And that used to be the way that we saw it. It was at a bad time in a relationship where the man usually uh, was undergoing some kind of trauma, some kind of depression, some kind of upheaval, and was taking it out on his wife. That's no longer held to be an explanation that's adequate, because it can also come completely without warning when there is nothing whatsoever of external circumstances that justify or warrant it. It can be accompanied by irritability and anger, or it can be calculated and deliberate and a way of simply inflicting pain on the partner. It can be associated with alcohol or drug abuse, but it's also inflicted by people who are stone cold sober. So what is it? What a profile of abusers. Let's look at what they're like. Abusers are not people with bad tempers. So if any of you guys have got uh, irritable and feeling uh, bad tempered occasionally, you can not be too worried about this. Most of us get irritable or bad-tempered at some time in our lives. That's not abuse. Studies on abuse perpetrators suggest they're really very opposite people. They're people who are controllers and manipulators. They're people who systematically undermine the partner they were abusing. Um, very often, to start with, using verbal, emotional, social, economic strategies and so on, uh, and then leading, slowly but surely, in most cases, though not in all cases, to physical and sexual violence. And those are really the, the, the trajectory of, a, of an abuser. The profile of an abuser usually means that unless it's addressed in a very early stage of abuse, then it will continue uh, and become more and more violent as the time goes on. And Natalie Collins, who's written her book called Out of Control, question mark, insists that abusers are not out of control. In fact, they're very, very much in control. 
and very often women describe how their throats have been squeezed almost to the point of asphyxiation, and then as they were losing consciousness, the man releases them so that they do not die. In fact, of course, the death rate is very high. It's very interesting, and uh, Karen Ingala Smith does a catalog of this. Her point is that um, men and women both are victims, and men and women both suffer in the homicide figures. But whereas women are largely killed by the men who are abusing them, men, if they are killed, and their figures are very much smaller, are usually killed by the women they are abusing. So it's a very unbalanced picture. It's very often as a last desperate attempt to get away from an abuser or to stop an abuse that the man in that situation gets killed. So the homicide figures themselves are lopsided and they're not accurate when we're describing the extent of um, uh, domestic abuse. What does an abusive mindset look like? And it looks like this. Um, there's blame. The other person is the problem. There's never, uh, never a situation where I might be the problem. And so the level of blame builds up and it usually convinces the victim that they are to blame. Well, maybe they don't try hard. You know, maybe they did do something that was offensive and they're worried about causing offense. And that anxiety about causing offense becomes very big because it's manipulated. Denial is part of it. I am not violent. I am not punitive. You make me do this. And um, having interviewed many, many perpetrators myself in studies, uh, this is a very, very common reaction. You made me do it. I had to do it. I was only reacting to her instigation. She forced the violence out of me. Undermining. Um, that leads on to imputing guilt to the other person. It's your fault. You're the guilty one. Um, and whatever you do, uh, you end up being the guilty one if you're the victim. This takes away the victim's self-confidence, obviously. But the, it plays mind games, as of course we all know about gaslighting, where many well-known uh, perpetrators actually deliberately distort the mental awareness of their partner so they become anxious about their own sanity and then spread lies, usually to get control of the children, that these people are actually on the verge of a mental breakdown or they're mentally incapacitated because they have been feeding and building up um, situations which are no longer normal for the person on the other side. And then manipulation. Manipulation in terms of relationships, attempting to control the relationships that that partner has, relationships with friends, patterns of going out with friends, patterns of sharing confidence with friends, going shopping, buying clothes, um, controlling manipulation so that the person can only wear what the partner wants her to wear, can only have the friends the partner wants her to have, and actually cuts off from everything else. And then finally, isolation. Cutting the partner off from places, from people, from uh, telephones, even monitoring their movements through tracking on the phone or what else. Cutting them off from the abuser, uh, from anybody independent of the abuser. And what about, how do we kind of tell who an abuser, abuse person might be? And this is very difficult and very dangerous, and I'm going to put a list of things on the board, but I want you to take them also with a pinch of salt, because a person might exhibit all these characteristics and not be at all uh, in danger of uh, domestic abuse. But those who are, are often isolated and very jumpy or anxious in their partner's company. They might be having a conversation, then their partner shows up and immediately there's a, a, a temperamental change in the person there. Become anxious, um, stop talking, voice lowers, jumpy, don't know what to say, uh, stutter. And there are all kinds of characteristics that are very important. They're, they're often reluctant or actually completely unable to speak for themselves. Very often questions to the person who is abused will be answered by the perpetrator. Uh, if that person is there. So the, the woman becomes used to being silent and not speaking for herself. Then unexplained absences, 
whether it's from work or school or college or wherever that person is, having very little access to money, not able to spend any money, not able to buy coffee uh, if they're going out for coffee with friends or anything like that, and little interest in appearance. This, for me, is a big one. Um, a girl came for a job in a college where I was interviewing, and I saw straight away when she came in that she hadn't come for a job. Uh, she'd come for help just by looking at her appearance. And this is the only way she could actually get access to someone outside that partnership by offering to come and, and be interviewed for a job. In fact, the man came with her. Very interesting. And I said uh, we, she couldn't be interviewed with him in attendance. This had to be a personal interview. I managed to get rid of him by calling a colleague saying, would you, take, uh, would you come and take him around the building so he can see where his partner might be working? Um, and as soon as he'd gone, I said, okay, why have you come? Um, you, are you struggling? Are you in a relationship where you are in some kind of um, difficulty? And she sobbed and she said yes, rolled up her sleeves um, and saw the burn marks right down both her arms and so on. Why had she come? She'd come because she'd heard that in the place that I worked, in the college that I worked, um, there was a possibility of some help. And so she made, manufactured this uh, interview, um, manufactured this application, which she had no chance whatsoever of going, and we only interviewed her because I thought there's something going on here, and we need to see this woman. In fact, in that story, it was a very interesting one. She had married um, an, a man from Iran, and he had married her because he wanted to stay in the United Kingdom. She had married him because he had bought her roses. Um, he'd been the only man who had been an interest in her. He'd wooed her and loved her and all the rest of it. And she'd fallen madly in love with him. Very shortly into the marriage, she realized he was a very abusive, very, very violent man who didn't care about her at all and was going to really strip her clean of all her money and the rest of it. And she could take all of that until he became extremely violent um, and she was in fear of her life. She had no contact with her parents um, because he wouldn't allow any contact with her parents. He cut her off from the telephone calls from her and so on. And he, she was completely isolated. And it was only when she said, but we now have no money. We've gone through all of my savings. One of us needs to get a job. And he wasn't able to get a job. He didn't have a visa. And I think I can get a job that he agreed to her coming to the college where I was working uh, and apply for a job. It was wonderful that I was there that day. It was, I think, providential. This woman was a Christian. Um, she thought her husband was a Christian because he had purported to be uh, a believer and all the rest of it. But she realized then, by now, that he was nothing of the sort. And it had all been a ruse to get a visa and to get um, residency in the United Kingdom. We had a very short time whilst he was away, being shown around the college to decide what to do. And she said she was afraid for her life. She was afraid she would be killed because his violence had got to such a stage um, that she could no longer control it. So I phoned her parents immediately. I, asked, uh, um, I phoned her landlord and I asked her father to go and collect the key for her flat to remove all her belongings immediately for her mother to come with a car and take her away. Um, they agreed that she would live with her grandparents, that the man knew nowhere, had no idea where she lived. Um, this was all being arranged when the man burst back into my office, having uh, got rid of my colleague because he was um, now very anxious about what was happening to his partner and demanded that she left immediately with him and forgot about the job. Well, the job doesn't matter, let us go, he said. So I asked him to sit down and said she would not be leaving with him at all, whereupon he started, uh, lifted his arm to strike me and you could see immediately that this was, in fact, a very, very dangerous man. And I pointed out that if he lifted one finger on me, I was not afraid of him. I would get the police here immediately, and he would spend a long time in prison. And he lowered his arm. And uh, I asked him to sit down. And then moments later, uh, my colleague went and took the woman out of, the house, out of my room. He tried to follow her. We shut the door. Um, I, I locked the door from outside. I locked him in my office and uh, <laughs> handed the girl over to her mother who took her away. Then uh, I opened the door. I told him to go back to his flat. I told him that we would now be phoning the police, but it was entirely up to his wife whether she made any charges against him. 
um, but he could forget about the relationship because as far as we were concerned, it was over. He was very, very, very angry. Um, if we hadn't restrained him, he would have broken every single thing that I had breakable in my office. So it was very easy to make a case for the police. Um, it was very easy. He got away before they arrested him, but I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that they followed it up. These are um, extraordinary circumstances, and looking at what somebody looks at, looks like, is very, very indicative to the control and the, the thing that's going on in her life. This other thing here, constantly checking upon her, is also very interesting. The study that they did on teenage adolescent uh, violence was fascinating because it was the very thing that had attracted the girl to the man in the first place that proved to be her downfall. She thought, very often these women would say they thought they were really lovey-dovey men because they were always wanting to know where they were, always constantly checking up on them, phoning them, texting, where are you now, what are you doing, when will you be back, and wanting a running catalogue of all their activities during the day. And they thought this was so romantic. This man cares so much about me. He just wants to know what I'm doing all the time. No, he didn't. He wanted to control her, completely control her, and have her in her gri his grip so that she had no freedom, she had no life of her own. And it's the very thing that attracts a woman to the situation where she realizes actually a prison is being formed around her. All of these other things, explanations of injuries not matching the evidence, withdrawal from conversations, very anxious about children. And if you've known this person for a long time, you suddenly realize this is not the person I knew. This is not the friend I've had all those years. There's a, a personality change which is very, very fundamental. Why stay in an abusive relationship. I'm asked this so often, so many times. If I had um, a five pound note for every time I'm asked this, I would be a very rich woman. And the answer is actually many, it's multiple answers. This is an answer one woman gave. We've grown up, this is an American woman, we've grown up in a different generation where women are leaders. We've got careers, we've got children, we break glass ceilings, you know, we actually get promoted. We expect to be strong and independent. When the abuse began, I thought, I can handle this on my own. Of course, that's the initial thing. So why do they stay? <clears throat> well, most women have little or no choice. By the time that they realize that the abuse is very strong and very deep, they will have few resources. They will have nowhere to go. It might be very, very difficult to actually um, engage the help of other people. The parents might not be that sympathetic, might not e even know what's going on in the relationship, might be very, very worried but not know how to help. But also, there's a denial that this is abusive. This, is a, this came out in almost all the studies I've looked at. At the beginning, the woman denies this is abuse. It's not actually abuse. I mean, he's just horrible to me, but it's not abuse. And it's only when it, the, the nature of abuse is spelt out that that becomes uh, obvious. I think I can cope. I'm used to it. I mean, this is a way of life. I, I don't like it, but it's the way it is. For the sake of the children. Children need a father. He's not touched them yet. And actually, if I take them away from him, how, how are they going to cope without a dad? It's not fair. But often they have no confidence to leave. What would I do? Where would I go? Um, how could I act on my own? And they sometimes don't even want to lose, lose a partner's status. There's something about having a partner, something about being married that they don't want to lose, and they don't want victim status. That's the very last thing they want. But also, there's fear of threats <coughs> and reprisals. <coughs> and, and this is the real <coughs> sticking point for many women, because the most dangerous part in the relationship is the time when she's trying to leave. And the threats and the reprisals can often be filled out very fully. And then there's nowhere to go. And one thing that we came across in a very recent study, which actually is very, very sad indeed, is this final explanation that the church says I should stay and forgive him and try a lot harder. And again, that's such a common response from women who are Christians and churchgoers when they finally break their silence and tell a leader um, that it 
comes out so quickly. But the church says, you know, there were two people who make a marriage, and I really got to try harder. And actually, it's all about forgiveness. And I was told just two weeks ago, I'm finding it so hard to forgive this man, says this woman. Can you help me to, to know how to do this? I said, what do you have to forgive him for? And she showed me bruises. She gave me catalogs of horrors and so on. I said, you know, you shouldn't actually be forgiving him. He should be crawling on his knees and pleading with you. Um, the whole idea that somehow you're at fault because you're not forgiving this guy, uh, it's a misunderstanding of whole Christian teaching. So those are some of the reasons, uh, and of course, the loss of identity. I don't even know who I am anymore. Where would I go? Who am I? Or is, what is there to do? What's the rest of life? It's a complete bewilderment, lack of confidence, lack of direction. Very often for many women, it's only when something starts to happen to their children that they realize the game is up and they have to get out of that relationship. Not only are they in danger, but so are their offspring. Uh, this is a real picture of a little girl whose mother finally plucked up the courage, the energy, and they got the help to get out of the marital home with her child still intact. I want you to look at these pictures and ask who they are. And they're women who were killed by their partners in January and February last year in the UK. How do we know that? We know it because there's a woman called Karen Ingala Smith. This has been live uh, broadcast, isn't it? Anyway, there is a, a woman in the UK who runs a website called Counting Dead Women, and she is amazing. She actually writes the obits, she collects the fit pictures, and she commemorates women who are killed by their partners. Why? Because they matter. Karen is an agnostic, an atheist. She doesn't think very much of Christians in the church, but she actually th thinks a lot of human beings and has so much compassion. And she keeps a record of murdered women so that they won't just disappear into the statistics because they were real human beings. We have to recognize that men are also the victims of domestic abuse. It's only fair to do that. And in fact, in the UK, and I gather in Canada, the, um, there's a rise in male victims of domestic abuse. But the incidents are very, very different. Uh, and there are fewer resources for men. And we have to think about this in the church too. Where would men go to? And in our organization called Restored, we also have a whole um, group of people now who are working with men victims of abuse and helping them to get their lives back together. Oh, this is a picture of myself and Karen Ingala Smith. Uh, I'm one of those wet Christians, but um, we still get on okay. <laughs> <clears throat> this is what she says. Women are usually killed by the men who are abusing them. Men are usually killed by the women they're abusing. I want to spend just a minute on global comparisons before I move on to say, okay, what do we do about it? Global comparisons, the World Health Organization, 50% of Bangladeshi women experience some form of domestic violence. Massive, massive number of the population. Acid attacks are very, very common. 603 million women live in countries where domestic violence still isn't a crime. And shame attacks, um, have, have we looked at yesterday. And if you look at some other comparisons in Australia, Canada, Israel, between 40 and 70% of female murder victims are those from domestic violence. In India, 22 women are killed every day in dowry-related murders. South Africa, a woman killed every six hours. Guatemala, two women murdered on average every day by partners. In Europe, seven women are said to die every day. And the level of violence and the kind, this is an acid attack. I'm going to show you the next picture very quickly. I'm only showing it to you because this is the woman's way of learning and living now. This is all she has for a livelihood since her partner, her husband, violated her by throwing acid all over her face and uh, destroyed the rest of her life. She lifts her shawl so you can take her photograph and pay her money, and this is her livelihood. This woman is 36 years old. And wherever you go, um, there are campaigns against violence and uh, abuse of women, and it's a 
fearful issue. Whenever the press comes in many parts of North Africa or other countries, out come the posters, out come the demonstrations, so that we will know this is an issue in their community and their culture. Why is it a Christian issue? Why do we need to be bothered about it? I know I don't need to ask you that question. I know because you've come to this lecture tonight because I've already had several days at Ambrose College and I have a huge respect for what you're doing, for the way you're thinking, for the way you're putting your Christianity in practice. But I'd done the slide anyway before I came, so I want to, <laughs> I still want to go through it. Because we're human beings, this is a real human issue. Because of our theology, our theology does give us, gives us no justification for doing nothing about uh, the violence in our society. Because of our incarnational ministry, we are here as God's ambassadors. We are here as God carriers to our generation. We are here as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We are here to model his love to those around us. We are incarnational, and that means we deal with the pain and the heartache of the culture around us. But finally, because if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. And that's what I now want to focus on in just a minute or two before we leave, leave the subject and go on to something. Um, we did a report in, with a number of universities sponsored by Restored, the organization I mentioned last night, uh, in Cumbria in the north of England to see what, would, um, what the statistics would look like if we compared the general population and the church-going population. We were hoping that we could show that the church-going population had a very, very much lower incidence of domestic violence or intimate partner abuse. We found the opposite. We found there was almost no difference between those people who went to church regularly and those people in the population who never went to church. And it was so sad a finding. But why is that the case? And the case is because, because the culture's too big for us. Because violence, when it's endemic in the culture, is going to affect Christian people in the church. And especially if the church is a cloning, closing a blind eye, if people are not trained in counseling, if disclosures are not handled properly, if it's never dealt with from the pulpit, if there are not counseling and pastoral groups that are clued in, it's going to happen and it's going to be silent and it's going to be pushed under the carpet. But also, <laughs> it happens when we distort the theology and even justify it. And I just want to take you through some theological distortions that I've come across when I was researching this, but even more so as I've been reaching out to the groups that are doing something about it. I want to take you into a best-selling book, it sold millions of copies in America, several editions. It sold far more copies than my book has, um, which is a great uh, loss and sorrow to me because it's such a rubbish book, and mine is a good book. <laughs> Even though I say so myself, it could be better, it's not perfect, but it's a lot of hard work into my book. But this is what she says. It's a book by a woman called Debbie Pearl, and it's called Created as His Help Meet. And this is what she says. God commands wives to submit to their own husbands. God informs men that they are the head of the wife. God tells the wife to be subject to their husbands in everything, every decision, every move, every plan, and all everyday affairs. Okay, where does he do that? And what Debbie Pearl has done, which she does over and over again in her book, she takes one verse, and then she actually puts words into God's mouth. They've got to be subject to their husbands in everything, every decision, every move, every plan, and all everyday affairs. I've not read that in my Bible. But there's more. God, oh, missed it. God, what God says stands regardless of the man's goodness or the apparent lack thereof. You were given your blueprints with words like honor, submit, and reverence. This is God's will, and this is up to us to believe and obey God. So there's another strange note. It doesn't matter what guy you're married to. It doesn't matter what he's like. You've still got to obey him in everything, every decision, every word, every plan, everything, just because this is what God wants you to do. But actually, you ask, um, what happens if he's a rogue? You know, what happens if he's a beast? What happens if he's um, hitting me? What happens if he's rotten with the children? Well, 
when God puts you in subjection to a man whom he knows is going to cause you to suffer, it's with the understanding that you are obeying God by enduring the wrongful suffering. I think that's heresy. I think that's appalling. The whole idea that God puts us in subjection of people who are going to harm us and damage us and hurt us deliberately so that we can obey God seems to be so far from the biblical picture of marriage that we get in the New Testament, a million miles away. So where does she get it from? And she gets it from a distorted theology, from a certain kind of attitude, um, and is actually pushing it on. In fact, what we're getting in all of that book, and I've just picked at random three statements, and it's peppered all the way through with ridiculous um, claims that she makes for Christianity and biblical teaching. It's biblical teaching subject to very poor exegesis. God is presented throughout as privileging the male. Whatever the man does is right because he is the God person. But also, male entitlement is established. The man is entitled to call the shots, entitled to get his will in the relationship and so on. And women's vulnerability is reinforced. Women's disempowerment is renamed as holiness and godliness and doing what God wants. And lower self-esteem is accepted as normal. Women who are violated become isolated, but they're blamed for being abused. They are to blame for their own abuse in the book. And I think it's very important to read the other side of that. The people who've done research on this say that this is not only bad theology, bad exegesis, it's extremely dangerous. And this is what Julia Bird, who is a woman who's done a great deal of research in churches and theology and the link between certain kinds of theology and certain kinds of uh, bad behavior in marriage. It's vital that teachers of male headships and all ministers, pastoring congregations where women are present, are conscious of the potential for abuse and are aware of the toxic form headship can take. It's not abstract and it can be dangerous for women. My research has unearthed many, many examples of the misinterpretation and abuse of a doctrine intended to be about sacrifice and often translated as being about power. So if you look at the research that's being carried out on um, theology, the mismatch or the link up between the kind of theology we have and what happens in intimate relationships, it produces a very interesting spectrum of, uh, of comments. So you get work by Christopher Ellison and Nicholas Wolfinger and Brad Wilcox. Brad and uh, Nicholas are working for the Institute for Family Studies and they give a very positive view of um, family life within church-going relationships. Very positive. Um, when if you look at the other side, Nancy Nason Clark, Kathleen Kleger, uh, Julia Bird and Christy Naun and a lot of others, they present a very different view and which of them is right. And we have to really hold this intention. This is Brad Wilcox's point. My research suggests that wives married to church-going evangelical men are comparatively safe. In the National Survey of Families and Households, husbands and wives were both asked if their arguments had gotten physical in the last year, and if so, if they or their partners had become physically violent. By these measures, church-going evangelical Protestant husbands were the least likely to be engaged in abusive behavior. I really want to believe that. And I do believe it in some ways, because certainly the men I know, and the men not only in my family, but the men I know well who fit that description would never harm their spouse and would always exhibit a loving, sacrificial relationship with their spouses. But actually, the statistics are not matching uh, the, the hopes that we have in this area. And it's also true that that does occur, domestic violence does occur, even in Protestant and evangelical households. This is a New York Times report last year. Domestic violence has been called a silent epidemic. In American churches, a two, 2014 survey of pastors found that most church leaders significantly underestimated the level of abuse in their congregations. A survey in 2017 found that just under half of the pastors had no policy in place on how to respond to victims of abuse. Four in ten rarely 
or never discuss the issue. When did you last hear a sermon in church which gave any kind of pastoral help or opened the possibility that there might be people in the congregation who needed help with their marital relationships? I just raise the question for your interest. And in fact, what Julia Baird found in her very, very extensive study in Australia was sadly the opposite, and it's, it's very sad. Um, and we have to take it, we have to take all of these studies very carefully because they are um, anecdotal, many of them, but many of them are also statistical. She says the stories we heard were brutal, decades of repeated rape, assault, financial control, emotional abuse, needing to ask permission to perform mundane tasks like drinking lemonade, suicide attempts, shattered lives, crushed self-esteem, a significant number of perpetrators were church leaders. And then she gives a whole catalog, a whole chapter full of uh, personal stories, all of whom have got their names changed. Many of these women were married to leaders in the church or articulate people in the church, and they now have all left the church as well as leaving their marriage. This is Kylie's story. There was one time when I hadn't folded the laundry, I put it away, threw it out of the house, said it was cluttering up the living area. When I went out to get it, he told me I couldn't sleep in the house that night because I'd been a disobedient wife. He made it clear he didn't want the laundry in the house and I defiled him, defied him and brought it back in. Her response was not to argue. It didn't even occur to me, she said, that this was unreasonable of him. Not until the marriage had got much worse and he'd become fierce. And one of them was for asphyxiating sex. He liked to have sex where he squeezed his wife's throat because it gave him um, a, a higher chance of evac ejaculation and a much higher intensity in his own sexual pleasure. And this is what she said. I feared sometimes when he strangled me during sex, I'd pass out. It genuinely terrified me that he wouldn't know when to stop. I feared I would die. I felt like it was how I could submit to him to give in to his desires and his need. That was my way, and she, he told her that was her way, of loving him and honoring him. And the sad thing is when these wives did go to try to get help from the church, uh, they found the help wasn't forthcoming, partly because there was no training. There was no awareness that these things do go on in households that look normal. And this is the, the researchers, another group of researchers said this. We found that many local pastors didn't believe women who came forward with stories of abuse. Church leaders often told women to submit to their husbands to endure and stay. I want to say that this is a solemn and sad picture, but of course it's not the predominant picture. The predominant picture of Christian marriage is a good picture, is a wholesome, healthy picture, because we are... Uh, we are serious about our partnerships with each other, uh, about our loving, sacrificial care for one another. And this is a, I, I think that we have to put that as prominent. But the fact that it can occur at all in our own circles uh, alerts us to the issue of getting our theology right and knowing that we need to do something about it in the way that we conduct our church business. So where do we go? What's the way forward in all of this? And I just want to spend a few more minutes and then let you come back to me. I think we need a lot more biblical focus on getting the Bible right. If we're people who believe in headship, we've got to know what it is that we believe in and what all those Latin terms and Greek terms mean and how we interpret them in today's culture. What these things mean, we don't just have stereotypical or knee-jerk reactions to the meaning of biblical terms. In fact, there's no such thing as a biblical term. Headship, of course, is not a biblical term. It's kephali, it means this thing on the top of your head, um, a Greek term meaning head. Uh, there's no ship attached. So even the, the word headship is a theological exp, um, exploration and exposition, really. It's adding something to a Greek word and creating a theological precedence out of it. And we, we're good at that, but we have to be cautious about it. We've got to understand the biblical text in context. We've got to ask questions about what is the literary genre. What is the language? How is the language translatable? What happened to the language when Latin invaded Greek um, and, dis and changed some of the meanings of the terms that we get in the scriptures? What were the original meanings? What were the intentions of the authors? Where does it come in the story of our humanness? How do we understand male-female relationships in terms of creation, sin, redemption? 
When the Bible says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, what does that mean? What part of the story is it? Is it the creation story that there's going to be dominant male dominance and rule in the creation because this is how God wants it? Or is it part of the sin story that sin has come into the human race and that has to be dealt with? And the consequences of sin is that you are going to be, the woman is going to be desiring the husband, but the cost will be male dominance. And those are different ways of interpreting simple texts, and we've got to do that all the way through. We've got to match the Gospels and the Epistles, the way Jesus talks, the way Paul talks. We've got to also link what Paul says with what Paul does. When Paul honors women, when Paul um, affirms women leaders in the church, when he sends the gospel uh, with Phoebe, his letters with Phoebe to the churches and so on, and is always acting in a very positive way when he talks about in Christ there being no more male or female, male and female, Jew or Gentile, slave and free. These are foundational passages for understanding much of what Paul is saying. And we also have to hold, in creative tension, hold together these four fundamental concepts in understanding gender. And the concepts are different. Male and female are different, but we're also same. The similarity, we're more like each other than anything else in creation. Complementarity, we fit together. Um, we kind of meet one another's deficiencies. We, uh, we, we work together because this is what we're meant to do. But most of all, we are in union as male and female, uh, in the image of God, in the body of Christ, and so on. All of these things are very important to sort out. And then we move on to initiatives, ways we can address it in our own culture, in the church. But beyond the church, we can offer redemptive hope and help to the culture as a whole. Better preaching on gender. Let's get it right. Let's get these passages right. Let's preach them. Let's give people hope and uh, a direction for their relationships. Better pastoral training and discernment. So when somebody comes to disclose, we can actually discern and understand what's going on. Relationship counseling. We need to do a lot more of that in our churches. Have pastoral groups that are well-trained and able to help people and help for survivors and perpetrators. Advocacy. We need to get laws changed. We need to have more robust laws. We need to have more help for people in trouble. And all of these other things. Gender, gender equal partnerships in the way that we run churches, do worship, have families, have neighborhoods and so on. And working with partners beyond the church. These are just some of the initiatives, just one or two, that we're busy with <coughs> at the moment in the whole area of intimate partner abuse in the UK. <laughs> Christian Initiatives Restored, I've mentioned yesterday. These are some of the folk very involved in Restored, um, doing a lot of work. First man standing, I've already mentioned, men standing together to actually try to work out what biblical masculinity, if there is such a thing, is really like, and not the stereotypes that are often pervaded from other quarters. Um, and my, this is my darling, beloved husband, who is an ambassador speaking again against violence in marriage. This is a bunch of our supporters uh, wearing high heel shoes and doing their uh, march for a mile. My husband won't join them. He thinks it's just a, a bridge too far. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a survivor's pack that we have put out for all the churches to use. So that if you are um, a survivor of domestic violence, you will find redemptive hope here. You will find help. You will find us trying to get people closer to God, trying to tap into the healing power of the Holy Spirit and the love that God has for them. And it's been a lifesaver for many people in the churches, and I hope it will turn the situation around. And it's wonderful for those outside the church. We're now getting this taken up by the population as a whole. And then there's advocacy. We've been trying to get the uh, Istanbul Convention ratified in our culture. These are two women from Parliament, one Scots Nat MP, who put this through as a member, private member's motion. The other is the um, when member of the, the chair of the Women's Council. And this is the bunch of folk who got it through. So it's now law in our country. And were it not for Brexit, we would have ratified it by now. These are advocacy things that we can do. We must work on every front, the biblical front, the theological front, the pastoral front, the neighborhood front, the familial front, the legal front, the economic front. Can we do that? We can. Can we all do everything? No. But there'll be people in your church who are skilled in one area or another who can take this up. 
and we can all make our churches hospitable places for people who are struggling with domestic violence and let them know that here is safety, here is peace, here is understanding, and here you will be put back into the loving arms of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Storkey, thank you so much for another riveting lecture. You've given us, again, an, a weighty amount of information to process and think through. And I think as most of us here tonight are people of the church, we are very privileged to have with us responding to Dr. Storkey's lecture, Pastor Marty Dolfo Smith from North Shore Alliance Church, who is the discipleship pastor at the church, and not only has been working in church ministry for 30 years in the Vancouver area, but has also counseled and walked alongside victims of abuse, particularly women, throughout her pastoral career. Marty has been a member of the Christian and Missionary Alliance board, and she's also been on several different boards of different NGOs serving vulnerable populations. Marty graduated from Regent in Old Testament, and not only is theologically sound and clued up in a lot of the things that Dr. Storkey has talked about us tonight, but she has pastoral experience in this question of what do we do as people of faith? How do we respond as the church? So Marty, please come. Thank you. Thanks, Jen, and thanks, Dr. Storkey. It's an honor to be here um, speaking alongside you. It's interesting, I was uh, preparing a sermon on violence against women uh, for the spring, and I ordered Dr. Storkey's book a year in advance, and Amazon did not come through. I was not able to get it, but Jen says there's a new, new edition coming out, so I hope I can get it now. Um, but I come to you as the granddaughter of a woman who experienced intimate partner violence and as the daughter of a mother of a woman who was traumatized by it. And it's uncomfortable for our family to talk about, but violence has infiltrated three generations of our family. And the intergenerational trauma is still impacting even the fourth generation. And so I know what it's like to experience it as it goes down the generations. And in my work, I've met many women who've experienced rape and sexual abuse and intimate partner violence at the hands of men that they trusted. I've sat with them, I've prayed with them, I've sent them to counseling, I've gone with them to see the police, I've gone to court, I've met with social workers, and I've helplessly watched their suffering in many ways, of both them and their children. And I've also unfortunately seen very few men willing to seek sustained help for their issues of power and control for mental health, anger, and violence. And I've even seen fewer who are able to reestablish healthy relationships. And it's heartbreaking to see that. So Elaine's message is a message we need to hear. It's something we need to familiarize ourselves with in order to be people who can walk alongside um, women are, who are struggling. Because in Canada and in the church, there, is, there are still families struggling with violence. I especially appreciate um, Dr. Storkey's awareness of the consequences that this has for women and, as I've said, for succeeding generations like mine. Um, in the church, I've met women who've experienced what she described. They've experienced bullying, electronic stalking, violence, threats, financial control, um, being cut off from people. I've seen women, vulnerable women especially, in relationships that they can't get out of. A couple of my women I've worked with have let me share some of their stories, but Sophia uh, was a woman who was traumatized in childhood by sexual abuse um, by a neighbor um, that went on for years. And when she moved into adulthood, she married a man who th she thought was going to be a good man, and he ended up being an abusive man. And she didn't know how to handle it. She was stuck in it for years. And I know many women that I know who were in violent relationships grew up in homes where there was unhealth and violence as well. And so again, it feels normal. They don't notice the signs and then they end up being re-traumatized. Um, I also see in the church, as, as uh, Dr. Storkey referred to, as not handling the situation very well. 
Uh, churches in the past especially haven't known how to respond. Uh, a woman who I'll call Laura uh, was in a situation where she, her husband was on the board of the church. Um, she, the abuse became increasingly violent. She was choked. She went to the church, uh, one of the church pastors, a female pastor, to tell her what had happened, and the pastor minimized it. Uh, eventually, the lead pastor tried to help, but crossed many boundaries that caused a lot of problems in the relationship, and as a result of that, the church kicked her and her husband out of the church and left her kind of to deal with the abuse on her own. The next church she went to, the pastor saw her as a dangerous woman um, and refused to support her. Um, and she didn't only have challenges in the courts, but she had challenges in other areas as well. But for her, this left her feeling like the church didn't want to be a part of, of supporting and helping her. Um, there are many challenges that women face in these kind of relationships. I've seen social services drop the ball. Um, the courts have dropped the ball. Um, and so again, it's very difficult uh, for people to respond in a way that is consistent and helpful. When I've heard these women's stories, one of the things that has amazed me is the consistency of their description of the men. These women are all different, but the way they describe the men is all the same. And they use similar techniques and they use threats. They can't stay in counseling. They can't even keep a lawyer. They often represent themselves. They become very, they're isolated from real community and support. And so it's amazing because you know a woman's telling the truth because she tells the exact same story as the last woman who came in. Um, and so again, listening and hearing these stories is really important because you start to learn, hey, this is a true story. Um, I also appreciate uh, Dr. S uh, Storky's analysis of why women stay in abusive relationships. And I've seen this in real life. I've seen women stay in these abusive relationships for years and years. They leave, they have a separation, they go back again, they leave, they have a separation, and they go back again. And this is particularly true, as Dr. Storky said, in the church, that women in conservative churches are less likely to leave violent re relationships they are more likely to believe the abuser can change. I've heard things like, Jesus can change anyone. Um, I have to believe in redemption, and yet no change is happening. They're less likely to get community support because of the shame they feel, and they're more likely to believe it's their fault and that they failed as wives. Um, and not only that, there is a culture of victim blaming and shaming in the church, and this often will cause women to leave the church entirely. The first woman I worked with um, was in a small was from a small town in Saskatchewan, and she was a pastor's wife. And when she disclosed her abuse to the board of the church, they told her to stay and submit. And so she left her husband and she left her church. And when I met her, um, she was in a lot of pain. She still wanted to have a relationship with Jesus. She still w wanted to be a Christian, and yet. It was, she was so traumatized by what had happened that it was hard for her to do that. And so I had a chance in that time to listen to her and to be able to express um, some of Jesus' heart towards her and, and towards her abuser. Um, I've also seen distress by women um, in the church who decide to stay in abusive relationships. And so they lose the love and support of their communities who want them to leave. Um, and they, so because they, 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 um, their communities think, I know what's best for you, you should get out of that marriage. And when they don't, they don't support them anymore. Um, and I've come to realize in these situations that, it, that women themselves know better than outsiders what they need to do and what's best for them. And that there are significant losses if they leave and if they stay. And it's a hard choice to see which one is worse. And these women don't need to be critiqued um, by their co Christian communities, but they need care, they le need a listening ear, and they need practical support. One such woman I worked with, when she returned to her abusive boyfriend, received an anonymous shaming letter from some women in our church who couldn't believe that she'd wasted the church's resources and now gone back to this man. Another woman I know who returned to her husband got chewed out by her social worker for doing it, and she was afraid to tell me she'd gone back to her husband because she thought I would reject her too. 
So how can the church turn this around? And Dr. Storkey gave us some good ideas. I'll talk a little bit about what some of the things we're doing in our church. So we do talk about abuse and violence against women in sermons. One of the things we've done is we have a brochure that we put in our foyer with the other brochures on intimate partner violence. It's by MCC. And then we add a piece on it that says, if you're experiencing this, come and see a pastor. Or we have a counselor in our area, Karen McCandless Davis, who's written a book called When Love Hurts, which is an excellent book. Um, and we say, go see her. And the, at least 10 of those brochures probably are gone every quarter. So there are women in our church who are seeing it and taking it. And are, we're, they're our hope is that they know we know that they are suffering and will eventually come and talk to us. Um, our pastors understand the dynamics of abuse. They're trained to identify people who experience it and support it. Um, we, have supporter, we have survivors of an intimate partner violence in our congregation who provide support to, to women who are struggling. When we find out that it's happened, we call the police or we take the women to the police station and uh, we remove the perpetrators from church leadership if they're in church leadership. I think the, the church in particular has some ways about talking about faith and marriage and Dr. Um, Storky talked about these that perpetuate violence in relationships. And I recently read a great paper uh, called When She Calls for Help, it's um, Domestic Violence in Christian Families. It was written by Leona Westenberg. And so she says that there's uh, Four things, submission, the way we talk about submission, the way we talk about the sanctity of marriage and forgiveness, and also God talk, the way we talk about God. So submission, Dr. Storky covered that quite well. Again, we need to be really careful that we're reading the Bible well, that we're using words that are good and true and helpful. Um, and we need to not encourage women to stay in abusive situations under the concept of submission. God talk, allowing our people to assume that God is male and therefore men are uniquely made in the image of God, also puts women at risk. And we need to talk about God in bigger terms than that. Uh, when we talk about the sanctity of marriage, again, women fear that they're sinning or offending God if they leave an mar abusive marriage. And we need to talk about healthy marriages and not just the sanctity of marriage. And then finally, forgiveness. Again, um, we talk less about repentance and justice than we do about forgiveness, and those are some things we need to be talking about. What is justice uh, for a woman who's been mistreated in her home? Uh, what does repentance look like in order to restore a relationship? I think we also need to teach young people, as Dr. Story talked about, signs of abuse. I talked to my daughters when they were in their teens. This is what it looks like. Stalking, control, jealousy can happen in a dating relationship. My daughter went away for a year to Germany, started dating a guy. He started tracking her by his phone. She broke up with him and said, Mom, I know what you were talking about. Um, but I think we need to teach our young women what it looks like. Often I'll say to women, like, when did you find out he was abusive? And many of them will say, oh, well, after the wedding. But I think there were signs before that they didn't see and didn't notice. Um, and then when women come to us, we can purpose to walk alongside them no matter what. The ups and downs of their suffering, their choices to go in and out and back in this long, complicated road of undoing this difficult relationship. And so again, we have teams of women um, in our community who are loving and supportive and walk with women who are struggling. I want to just briefly touch on one of the things Dr. Storky talked about and uh, the report on the uh, murdered and missing and indigenous women came out um, last year. And again, nearly 60% of indigenous women um, in Canada who reported uh, spousal abuse also reported physical injuries um, and severe forms um, that indigenous women are more vulnerable um, because of colonialism and intergenerational trauma to abuse. So again, in the church, I think we just can't look inside, though there are indigenous women in our churches as well, but outside we need to be advocates for women in our community who are vulnerable. And as the report talked about, we need to do that in a way that's respectful of them, of their culture, um, of the trauma that they've experienced. Uh, we need to be advocates um, and call out for justice for women and in indigenous communities, in Indian communities, and other communities in our society who are facing um, suffering in, in this kind of way. 
And in conclusion, I want to say I do appreciate Dr. Storkey's words of hope. And, and I think of my family in the midst of the devastation of the um, intimate partner violence in our family. Christ entered into the story. My aunt became a Christian, and then my mom, and finally my grandma. And we began to experience God's love and uh, healing of some of those wounds. And things are looking very different for the fourth and fifth generation in our family. My friend, who is shunned uh, by her churches, found a good group of women. They meet together, and they pray, and they provide the support she needs as she lives with the consequences of her ex's control and violence. And I watch women in our congregation who are in recovery from abuse supporting and helping other women. And I believe that the spirit of Christ is at work in the body of Christ to uncover abuse and to bring justice and freedom. And he's calling us as followers of Christ to participate with what the Spirit is doing. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Colin Toffelmeyer. I'm an Associate Professor for Old Testament Studies here at Ambrose University. We do have a short amount of time for questions this evening. So if you do have a question, uh, Professor Buchanan is going to have the mic ready and he can bring it to you. Uh, so if you can just show your hand, he will certainly come and find you. Um, I would, this is, this, is, this is the fun thing about running the question times, I get to make choices. And if at all possible, I would be quite interested in giving the first question here to um, one of the women in the audience, and particularly if there's a female student that would be interested in, to, uh, not to put any pressure on anybody, <laughs> but I think that would be a, a wonderful.